Now this car seems to be incredibly fault tolerant because I'm trying to see how many modules I can disconnect and still have the thing work and drive. Despite the fact that we have no centre console, it's over here. And this is not just output, this is a touch screen, so you need it to do things. We've got no air conditioning controls, we've got no radio selector. I've pulled out um, all this stuff from the centre dash, that's detecting the presence of the key, that's the tyre pressure monitoring system, that's just the USB. Now this module I've had to retain because it's measuring the yaw and pitch, so it measures how the car tilts and pitches. And if it pitches too much, it automatically applies brakes and goes into hill descent mode, that kind of thing. Without that module there, it has a complete fit and we do need it. Even though we don't need hill descent functions and things like that, we still need that module there. What else have we got? We've got the gear selector, which is still connected. Better not twist those wires too much. We'll just turn that around. So that's quite useful. Now this critical module we've seen before, that's the one that detects when you've had a crash. So you might ask yourself the question, where do you think the sensors are in the car that detect there's a crash, measure the G-forces and decide whether or not to fire the airbag that we've cut off? Well, a lot of people, when you ask them that, they say, oh, it must be in the bumper bars because it's the closest thing to the crash. Not so. The sensors are protecting the driver. So you'll find the sensors that are measuring the G-forces are very close to the driver. Sometimes they're in the seat rails or the very centre of the car in the tunnel. They know whether it's a front on or a side on or which airbags to fire. So it's happily sitting here and what it's done, this poor person's had a crash and it doesn't look like a very fast one, about 30 k's an hour I'd estimate uh, from the look of the damage. Nonetheless, that's enough to for the sensors to go, whoa, we just had like 20 g's of deceleration or 30 g's or something. And it might have asked another module, it might have asked this one, what do you think? And it said, oh, we had 25 g's and we better protect this person. So they've fired the airbag and disabled the car. It's disconnected the high voltage battery. It's triggered a permanent note in there in, in the memory in that device to say, this unit is a goner. You can't use it again. If ever you plug it in, it thinks there's been a crash, the car won't go. It won't allow the contactors to the high voltage battery to reconnect if it sees that module. But to our surprise last time, we found that if you disconnect this module, it just ignores it and you can go. So, that's where we're at. We've got all these things disconnected, yet I can get in the car with my key, push the start button, it's ready, put foot on brake, press again, dash lights up, brake accumulator's working, power steering's working, the air conditioner's come on, even though the entire air conditioning controls are not even connected, the aircon's still working, dash is good, we've got a minor problem with the hill descent thing, a little warning there, but I can go, drive, and drive the car. The one thing we can't live without is behind there. See that? That's the body control computer, and it's associated fuses for. Half the things on that fuse panel we don't need, but we do need the body control computer because without it, the key doesn't work, the dash doesn't work, we don't know what we're doing and it won't activate itself. So we do need that. But I'm staggered that we can disconnect so many things and the car still drives. I think we need the dash. The dash is important. There's a lot of information there. Our high voltage battery voltage, the 12 volt battery, and heaps and heaps of other alerts and stuff here. So even though we've got no center screen, this I think is important. So let's try and find a way to integrate that into the Porsche. Back we go. Try not to hit the fence because I haven't got any reversing camera at the moment. Right, so that's the cabin sorted. I think we figured out which modules we need and which we don't. Similarly, looking under the bonnet, this one is the VCM. That's the engine control computer. That's the brains of the engine management. Made by Bosch. As you can see in China and we need that definitely without that the motor it's just immediate fault not going anywhere the other one is around here on the ABS unit and if you disconnect that the car also has a complete hissy fit it says no you can't operate without brakes so even though the ABS sensors are disconnected at every wheel they're, they're just we physically pulled them out so the car does not register any speed it will still happily drive so Matt 
This is the engine's ECU, right? Mm, correct. And the question is, can we charge, obviously the battery is the most important thing for us, can we charge if all this is gone? Well, if, if we've just got the charger uh, and its cooling system, because mm -hmm. there's a cooling system for that. The, anyway, the question is, if we disconnect this, can we charge still? Mm. Let's find out. Take that off. Showing voltage in, not charging. Motor faults, yeah, we know that. We've just disconnected the ECU. Connected but not charging. Okay, we might need the ECU. No, it's not locking on, but no charge. Gotcha. Uh, I'd say it probably controls monitoring of the batteries mm. uh, and it probably does the interlock for that mm. actual charge connector mm -hmm. yeah and it monitors the temperature of this because this needs cooling true yeah there it goes. did it oh yeah made the noise okay you were right you're the brains of this no, operation. I, I, <laughs> What's with the Roman toga? It's, oh, it's, it's just, not very... just, just a rag. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's bad news, really. It is bad news, yeah. We need, the, we need the bloody thing. I guess even if we use this and the batteries, we still need an independent brain to go, hey, what's the temperature? Hey, when should we switch on the cooling fans, the cooling pumps? So... Is it, when is it charged? When is it charged, stage? yeah. Man, monitoring Where's the charge rate. Which is a shame because the ECU is tied to the motor. Mm. And if we don't want the motor, we could have sold it. Uh, yes. But you can't sell it without the ECU. Mm, yes. Damn. Let's see if we're charging now. Yep. Yep. Poo. It's a bit messy in here, Matt. Yeah, I know. God, don't you got, you got a lot happening. Yeah, too many jobs. What are we drinking? It doesn't give you wings. It gives you a fat tummy. There goes my Red Bull sponsorship. You and your cylinder heads. Whenever I film you, you're always doing a cylinder head. It's too many. So this is a funny story. You went to pick it up and they gave you the wrong one. And I bolted it down like it is now. Mm -hmm. And I get the phone call. Have you bolted the head on yet? I said, I'm just finished. I need it back. It's not yours. You know, he said, we've taken a lot off it. Yeah. You don't want this head. No. Tales from the workshop with Matt. It probably never happened again, mm. but uh, two 2.7 heads and on the bright side you didn't have to carry it back on the, on your motorbike like you normally do that's it you got you got to ride in the mgx power in a car that will never have combustion <laughs> do you know what i mean it's just quite bizarre yeah yeah it's just... mate it's going that way i would never take it on a motorbike that's unsafe <laughs> never <laughs> look it, this is not going to die out in a hurry there are still yeah. going to and the more these that stay on the road the more the less reliable they'll become and the more they'll need you so don't worry, you'll have plenty of work on these things to come. Still weighing up the big question of whether we can use the MG motor as a trial, you know. You could say it's it's not the ideal motor, but for the sake of, it all works together. Yeah. Why right. not give it a run, see yep. how it goes, and if it's not grunty enough, pull it out, put the Tesla motor in. It's one approach. Definitely. It, it's a lot of work. Whichever way we go, it's a lot of work. It's, it is a lot of work. The more we're learning about the communication side of everything, yeah. I think, it, to me, it seems more plausible than going an aftermarket route, you know. The fact that it all works together, just it like the whole It all works together. The con everything's controlled at the right timing, at the right temperatures. Mm. You know, it's all very OEM-like. Yep. You know, aftermarket parts, we'll need less of them because we're using, utilizing all of the system where, mm. you know, I may have said it before, but... Now that we're learning about the mark, like ECU, mm. which manages ev which virtually manages everything, everything. So, utilizing the battery management system, mm. the inverter, and everything, it's going to be some serious uh, data in and out of, yep. you know, to control everything. Even if we do get to use those standalone, mm -hmm. they won't output a signal to turn on those cooling pumps, mm. to yep. turn on the fans, mm. to say, "Hey, I'm charging. I'm getting hot. Turn it on." So we end up having to need another aftermarket system. Mm. So, okay, we need more room now to put a, yep. a box, more wires, a relay box, you know what I mean? Yep. Where if we use all this system, we're using the factory fuse boxes, all the wiring factory, um, you know, obviously the loom lengths can be modified, but mm. 
we're getting all the nice parts of it, even that little interlock for the charger. Mm. What controls that? Mm. It's that ECU, mm. and that's gone. So there's another thing. Oh. Okay, we take all that. Let's say we take all that. Yes. Now the question becomes, do we take the MG's motor to, to get it? Because it's also very well integrated. Yes. The thing with the MG motor, we've got two options. Yes. If you look at the way it sits in the car, the motor's in front of the differential. Yep. And if we put that in the back of the Porsche, in that configuration, yep. it wouldn't fit. The cross members across there. I'm not prepared to make structural changes because yep. that'll pose problems with registration. Yes. We need that massive support cross member running across right next to the drive shafts. Yep. So we've got to do something with the motor. We can either turn it round, yep. so left becomes right, yep. turn it round the other way, or we can flip it over, run it upside down. Yes. Which you could never do with the petrol motor. But, no. But um, it's possible if you can address the issues of cooling and lubrication of the diff. Yep. So there's two options there, and they're worth talking through. You go, but hang on, Stu, if you turn it round left to right 180 degrees, yep. then when you put it in drive, it's, the car's going backwards. I've got good news there as well. It's not hard to make an AC motor run backwards. In fact, that's what happens every time you put it in reverse. So they are designed to run backwards. In reverse, though, there's a limit. There's a software limit that says you can only do 30 or 40 k's an hour in reverse because it's dangerous. Yes. It's like trying to push a shopping trolley backwards. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So now we'll go to the voiceover so I can explain it a little bit better. Bye. Yes, for the MG motor to fit, we need to get the motor to the rear of the car behind the differential. So we either have to roll it over, almost upside down, or just rotate it in plan view and reverse the polarity. So drive makes it rotate backwards and selecting reverse makes it spin forwards. Now you might wonder how you do that with a three-phase AC induction motor. With a DC motor, you just swap positive and negative, right? But in concept, the idea of running an AC induction motor backwards is actually very simple. You see these three phases in an anti-clockwise direction in order red, yellow, and blue. Now if you swap any two of those, red and blue, or blue and yellow, or red and yellow, any combination, and look, you'll see the order 1, 2, 3 is always clockwise. So now if you select drive, your motor runs backwards, and select reverse, it'll go forwards. Ironically, you can thank Nikola Tesla for this clever idea. After all, he was the dude who invented alternating current in the first place, as a rival technology to Thomas Edison's direct current. You rock, Nikola. But as a further irony, Edison spread a lot of misinformation about the dangers of Tesla's AC power, even using it to electrocute stray animals as a demonstration of, don't say I didn't warn you. Does this remind you of anything? The more times change, the more they stay the same. And drive. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you cannot use the MG's motor in a Porsche stew. Can I use the motor in this or is it too puny to put in a too Porsche? Too puny for a Porsche, I'm afraid. But the thing is with this motor, it produces all its torque right across the range and it's 350 Newton meters, which is almost as much as the 400 the Porsche does, but the Porsche only does it right at the top end. You know, it, it's still gonna go pretty well in a lightweight car. Uh, we've got this fully working car. Why not just use the lot? Well, I'll tell you why, Mr. Wimpy Stew, because however you justify it, that MG motor is not going to set anyone's underpants on fire. As a proof of concept for all the other systems, yes, I get it. But you started on this journey, so don't lose your bottle now. Once you get it working and you found out it's not as impressive as it should be, swap that motor out for a Tesla unit and unleash some serious grunt. Remember, this car has to be quicker than any petrol 928. But yes, once you get all these things to work, all these things on screen, the DC fast charging, sat nav, Bluetooth, the kinetic energy recovery system, that modern dash, the entertainment system, the range estimation, all that stuff, sure, but then ditch the MG motor. So yes, you will need to buy more bits, a second engine controller and the Tesla inverter to go with the motor. So yeah, maybe. My suggestion, don't overthink it. Next week, let's just take it to the experts and they might have a completely different idea. It's probably the single most difficult part of this project. Won't be fitting the motor or building the battery box or anything like that. It'd be figuring out what electronics we can use and how they work. So we'll do what's called a bit of CAN bus sniffing. It sounds very rude, but it actually just involves tapping into the CAN bus and reading the signals and seeing which units we can use and which ones we can't. So that'll be the next step. Uh, and that's beyond my skill set. So off we go to Windsor and together, it's in all our interests to figure out how the CAN bus works.